Good. Hey, my name is Alex, and I'm one of the pastors here at Fellowship Bible, and uh, we're just excited that you are uh, here with us this morning, that you have joined us um, for worship. Uh, man, our, our mission here at Fellowship Bible is that we, first and foremost, want to worship God. We want to share the gospel and the good news message of Jesus Christ, and then build one another up, build believers up, exhort one another, and so we're just excited that you've joined us today, and we do hope, as uh, Toby was saying a little bit earlier, that you'd let us know that, that we were here, and if we haven't met yet, maybe you've been coming around, it could be your first day, I'd love to meet you as well, and so right after the service, I'll, I'll be out in the lobby uh, shaking hands, so hope you'll come by and say hi. I also want to congratulate the newest uh, married couple at uh, Fellowship Bible Church. I don't think they're here with us today. At least I hope <laughs> for their sake that they're not. Um, but uh, Jared and Lake and Loman were married the other night in a beautiful ceremony, and so we are uh, excited uh, to see what God's going to do in their marriage and relationship with one another. And so it was, was good to see so many of you uh, there. Um, okay, <clears throat> here's how I want to start today. I want you uh, to think with me or maybe take a journey back to your childhood for just a little bit and think with me about nursery rhymes or children's rhymes. And we all seem to know some of them, whether we, uh, we, we remember them from childhood or, uh, uh, or we remember singing them uh, to our kids or reciting them uh, to our kids. And so as I think about that, some that come to mind, uh, one that, uh, that comes to mind immediately is Rockabye Baby. And so I'm going to need you to sing this with me, okay? So let's just sing it, okay? Rockabye Baby in the treetop. Okay, stop. So let's just stop right there. You, it's not on you. You did a wonderful job. You sound great. Um, here's the deal. Wendy and I have two children, and by God's grace, uh, they've made it to 30 and 28. In fact, our daughter turns 31 in just a few days. And um, we read lots of books uh, to prepare for kids, and I don't remember them all. Uh, what to expect when you're expecting um, growing kids God's way, like you, you name it, all the Parenting 101 books. And I do not recall in all of the books that we read any suggestion, any instruction that was wise that would say that you should uh, try to put your kid to sleep in a treetop. <laughs> it's like, who writes these things? Children's rhymes are weird. Um, I think of another one, patty cake, patty cake, baker's man. Bake me a cake as fast as you can. Roll him up, roll it up. Yeah, see, so here's what happens. We all know the first part, but then we all know different, like, second parts uh, to that. Uh, how many of you think it's patty cake? Patty cake. Oh, my God. No, see, yeah, it's not. You're wrong. <laughs> it's pat a cake. And here's what's strange. Um... I've, I'm a little bit of an amateur baker, and uh, this all happened during COVID. Uh, my wife got me hooked while we were at COVID, and we weren't going to church, and we weren't going to work, you know, for like the first six weeks or whatever that was. It's all a blur. I'm trying to forget about it. Um, she, she had us watch the Great British Baking Show on Netflix. Are any fans? Paul Hollywood, all that kind of stuff? Yeah. And so we've seen them all now. There's a new season that just was released. We're saving it until all the episodes come out so we can binge it. Um, and so I just thought, this looks easy. <laughs> and so I learned to bake, and I've made several cakes. And here's the deal. You don't, there's nothing about patting a cake. <laughs> I don't, again, I just don't understand children's rhymes. Um, but here's one that's perhaps the most ridiculous nursery rhyme that we learned growing up. Uh, and it's the one that we don't think is so ridiculous. And that is, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. And, and that just couldn't be further from the truth, could it? As we continue our study of James this morning, he's going to tell us that, that nothing could be further from that truth because few things in our lives do more damage than the things that we say and the words that we use. And so if you have your Bible or your James journal, I'm going to invite you to turn with me to James chapter 3. 
James chapter 3. And as you're turning there, we're coming into the next great teaching section of the book of James. Last week was really the center of the letter. And, uh, and James talked to us about faith and works. And now, in the rest of the letter, in chapters 3, 4, and 5, um, James is going to expound on this idea of what it looks like um, for us to work out our faith. And so it gets really, really practical from here on out. And in chapter 3, James is going to begin with our words. He's going to remind us about the awesome power of the tongue to accomplish um, either good or evil. And so let's see what he has to say about this and how we are to talk to one another. So we'll just begin in chapter 3, verse 1. He says, Not many should become teachers, my brothers, because you know that we will receive a stricter judgment. Okay. So James starts, just verse 1, he starts with a warning to um, teachers, and not just any teachers, but, but more specifically, he's addressing spiritual teachers. Um, the Greek word used here for the word teachers is didaskalos, didaskalos, and it, and it means teacher or master. Jesus um, throughout the Gospels, is often referred to the didaskalos, speaking about the divine power and authority in which he was teaching. Jesus is uh, a master spiritual teacher. The significance of this word extends into the New Testament as well and into the early church. Many of the um, early apostles and church leaders, people like James himself, were viewed as didaskalos, as spiritual teachers. They were the people who were entrusted with the task of, of spreading the good news, the message of, of salvation, helping people work out their faith and, and journey down a path of, of righteousness, kind of like the expectations that we put on pastors in the local church today. And so since we're starting with teachers, let me just start with me. The things that I regret most in ministry... And probably, if I was just being completely honest, uh, in my entire life, going back to my childhood, is when I said the wrong thing. Or uh, maybe I said the right thing to the wrong people, or I said the right thing to the right people in the wrong tone. And so this verse in the book of James is the most um, convicting to me personally. And he says that we shouldn't seek to be teachers because there's a responsibility that comes with teaching. And he names it here. He says, you sit under a stricter judgment. And so I love the fact that I get to teach the Bible, but that also means that I live under this tremendous weight. And I don't want to make the sermon about me. And so let me just deal with this real quick and, and then we'll move on. Um, as I'm getting older... And, and, and I, I don't know if that means wiser, but as I'm, I'm getting older and more experienced and uh, reaching a, a point in life where it's, uh, my ministry is uh, about legacy. And uh, I've just sensed over the years the Holy Spirit um, telling me, hey, your leadership style, uh, the way that, that you lead others, the way that, that you lead the staff, the, the way that you interact with the congregation, uh, it needs to become more fatherly. It needs to become more like a, a spiritual father in the sense, right, that um, like you were talking to your son or your daughter, okay, and that, that doesn't make you my children, okay, I don't mean it in that sense, um, but I mean it in the sense that as a father would speak to their children that you can say hard things, um, but you have to say them in ways that the love and the care and the concern is obvious. And, uh, man, if you could pray for me, because I don't always get this right. Um, but that's really my heart's desire, is to be a, a better spiritual father, better, better spiritual leader to help us, to help our staff, um, to help our congregation, to help our church just become increasingly um, healthier spiritually. And that's 
That's the heart of James's warning here, right? So pray for me, pray for our elders, pray for our staff, pray for uh, other teachers uh, in our church who carry this responsibility um, of teaching. And so he starts with teachers, and now he gives us something for everyone. Look at verse 2 with me real quick. He says, For we all stumble in many ways. If anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is mature, able also to control the whole body. I I love this line. I think it's helpful in a couple ways. Number one, he says, uh, for we all, and again, pastoral joke. I looked that up in the Greek this week, and all means all. (laughs) Uh, It means everyone, right? There's no exceptions to this. And so James is talking to everyone, but, but it's really for we all what? Stumble. Like, th- this is a great word to use. Like, have you ever tripped? Sure, surely you have. That, that's a silly question. You, you're walking along, and you don't see the curb, and you trip on the curb. Or, um, you know, uh, in, our, in our new home, uh, this, this one we just moved into um, 14 months ago, uh, hardwood floors or whatever in the whole entire house. We've never owned a home like this. It's really awesome. Uh, but then we have rugs everywhere, and some of them, like, sit up a little bit higher, a little bit thicker, and sometimes I stumble like a trip. I just, you know, or at, at night when you get up and you go get a glass of water, maybe you're just like, oh, I didn't see that wall there. And, uh, <laughs> right? Um, so, so we all stumble. Here's what's great about that word because... Um, it means you don't do it intentionally, right? You don't stumble on purpose. Stumble, stumbling is something that you do on accident. It, it's just that we're not paying attention. That's what happens when we stumble. And just as we stumble physically, we stumble with our words, right? Sometimes the things we say are not necessarily premeditated, although sometimes they are. We're just being stubborn and obstinate. But sometimes the things that we say uh, are just because we're not paying attention, because we lack control, because we're not being intentional and and thoughtful about what we're saying. And and I know that you do that too. Listen, we all clean up pretty well on Sunday morning uh, when we show up here and we interact with one another and we all know the right things to, to say and we can all, you know, give the Sunday school answer and that kind of stuff. But the truth is, if I wanted to really know what you were like, I would just ask those people that were closest to you. I'd ask your husband or your wife or your family, like, what, what do they really say? What, what, what's really their speech like when they're not here on Sunday morning? And if you were being truthful, it's not always a pretty picture, is it? We say dumb things. We get hot-headed, and things just fly out of our mouths that we don't mean. We get angry too quickly. Not only that, but we're too slow to forgive often when we speak with one another. We embellish stories. We criticize without knowing the facts. We make mountains out of molehills. We speak before we listen. We brag too much. We use words as weapons. We belittle people who don't think the same way that we think, who hold a different opinion. And James says, when he says, we all stumble in many ways, he's including all of us, right? I stumble, you stumble, we all stumble. And then that brings us to the surprising, like truly the surprising part of verse 2. He says, if anyone does not stumble in what he says, that person, he is mature, able to control his whole body. In other words, and this should be a, a super sobering thought, how you control your tongue, the words that come out of your mouth, reveal your spiritual maturity or lack thereof. That, that word mature, again, there in, in the Greek is uh, this idea of whole, like a completed uh, circle. It's this wholeness and, and, and or completeness. And, uh, and so he, he's kind of like, uh, show me a person who controls what he says, and then I'll show you a person who's like entirely and completely in control of their life. So sobering, isn't it? And we have this warning, first the teachers, then this warning to to everyone. And James says, be careful what you say. Guard how you use your words. 
And then as we've seen throughout the study, um, we've learned that, that James likes to use case studies. He likes to use um, practical examples. And so he does the same in this passage. Take a look at this. Look at verse 3 with me. He says, Now if we put bits into the mouths of horses so that they obey us, we direct their whole bodies. And consider ships, though very large and driven by fierce winds, they are guided by a very small rudder wherever the will of the pilot directs. So too, though the tongue is a small part of the body, it boasts great things. Consider how a small fire sets ablaze a large forest, and the tongue is a fire. The tongue, a world of unrighteousness, is placed among our members. It stains the whole body, sets the course of life on fire, and is itself set on fire by hell. Okay, so these illustrations hardly need an explanation, um, but, but let's walk through them, right? He talks about uh, a bit. And so if you've never uh, ridden a horse, um, there's just this little bit. It's, it's, it's what it's called. It's, it's just a little piece of metal uh, that's about five inches wide and weighs a few ounces, and you put it in the horse's mouth, and that's what the reins are attached to on a horse. And, and, and so when you uh, pull those reins to the left, the horse goes that way. If you pull the reins to the right, the horse goes that way. If you pull back uh, on the reins, uh, the horse doesn't like this little piece of metal, and it's well, pulling it backwards, and so it will stop. Okay, we, I think we all understand that. He says the same thing about a ship. He's like, you can have this big, massive uh, ship, and uh, you've got this rudder that um, sometimes rudders are quite large, especially on cruise ships, but in proportion to the ship itself, the rudder is rather small. And, and so he's like, hey, when uh, back in their day, like wind blew through the sails, and, and so that's how you steer the ship. And so the captain of the ship would turn the wheel this way, which would turn the rudder, and it would cause the ship to go that way. And you turn it the other way, it causes the ship to go other way. Ships don't have brakes like that. <laughs> At least ones that are wind driven by sails, and so you can't really stop it. But listen, it's a big deal because it's the difference between ending up in Miami or Hong Kong, right? On how you control the ship. And so he just uses these simple little illustrations to talk about how using the bit or using the rudder, steering the tongue requires discipline. It, it, it requires intentionality to be effective, to use those things, right? And so the, so the lesson here is because the tongue's got a lot of power to influence every part of life, we have to learn to control it and direct it properly. And, and, and then he talks about fires as well, this analogy of forest fires, how uh, in essence, I, what I picture in my mind is the we, we read about them all the time, a little campfire that somebody forgot to tend to, and then it, it spreads and burns the whole forest, right? He's like the tongue. The, the words that you speak can wreak major havoc. It can burn down a forest. So he's like, man, the tongue, it can deliver great evil or it can do enormous good. In fact, Proverbs so many Proverbs about our words and how we speak. Let me just share one with you. Look at this one. Proverbs 18, 21. It says, death and life are in the power of the tongue. Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruit. What an incredibly sobering thought that every time you open your mouth, you have the power to either create life or cause death by the words that you speak. And then James closes out this whole section talking about uh, blessing and cursing, and he uses a few more illustrations. So look with me, um, verse 9. Skip down to verse 9. He says this, with the tongue, we bless our Lord and Father, and with it, we curse people who are made in God's likeness. Blessing and cursing come out of the same mouth. My brothers and sisters, these things should not be this way. Does a spring pour out sweet and bitter water from the same opening? Can a fig tree produce olives, my brothers and sisters, or a grapevine produce figs? 
Neither can a salt water spring yield fresh water. So, so what's great about this uh, is that James is showing us, I think, here that there's a better way. And what he does is he compares and he, he contrasts a couple of different directions, a couple of different decisions here, two different choices where our speech can take us. In verses 9 and 10, he shows us that our words can be used to bless God, right? Or those, those words can be used to, to curse people. We can, we, we can bless others. We can curse others. It's a choice. Verses 11 and 12, he primarily is comparing our tongue here and our speech to a spring, He's like, that spring can either bring forth sweet water or, or fresh water, or it can bring forth bitter or salty water. Again, he's like, it's a choice. It's not like a toss of the coin. It's not like you don't know what's going to come out of your mouth. He's like, you have a decision to make. How do you want to speak to others? How do you want to use your words? Right? The, the idea here is that we have a decision to make regarding what we say and how we say it. And that decision is either to use our words to bless people or curse people. Right? Th those words are either to glorify God or, or to, to blaspheme God. And, and so in this whole passage, we've already seen this, he's talking about how, how the tongue, how our words can be extremely destructive. But James gives us, right, this good news that, that we can dedicate our tongues, um, we can dedicate the words that leave our mouths and use them to be a blessing to others. I mean, I don't mind telling you, uh, having been here 14 months now, that I uh, have, have, have a front row seat to this. Like, I have been blessed by many of you uh, that are in the room, right? Your words have encouraged me. Um, your words have strengthened me. In fact, I, I want you to know this. When you send me um, little notes, whether I, I get those uh, in, in the mail or you just leave them in my mail slot, sometimes they just randomly show up uh, on my desk. Sometimes you hand them to me in the service. Sometimes you mail those things uh, to my house. Sometimes you send them to me in an email and I print them off. And here's what I do with them. I keep them in a drawer in my office. I have a designated drawer uh, in my office where when someone sends me something that's just uplifting and encouraging, I put it in this drawer. You give me other things sometimes as well. Briella Rose, where are you at this morning? I know you're in this room. Right there, uh, Briella brought me a cinnamon roll this morning. <laughs> it's not going in the drawer. <laughs> I'm not going to share it either. <laughs> Too bad. <laughs> it's Pastor Appreciation Month. She brought it for me, so I'm just saying. Um, but I take those notes and the, those cards, and I put them in this drawer. And whenever I'm having a down day, Whenever I'm throwing myself a little pity party, I just go and open that drawer, pull out a stack of things, and I just start reading them. And, and so you're not just blessing me one time. Just know you're blessing me again and again and again. We can encourage others with our words. And then just let me say this, too. Um, the best defense is a good offense. Right? So if you struggle with words, if you're struggling with saying things, maybe sometimes saying the right things in the wrong way, or you struggle with harshness, or you struggle with gossip, like the easiest way to, to fight against saying the wrong things is to start to say the right things. And it's really the same principle in every area of our life. When we look at the cross, when we look at Jesus, when we are doing what we're, we're not supposed to be doing, we, we look to those things so that we can get back on track because if we're doing the right things, then the truth is we don't really have time to do the things that we're not supposed to be doing. And with our words, I love what James says here, and with our words, the most righteous thing that you can do is to praise and bless the name of the Lord. And so as we bring this message to a close, it's so practical, I want to give you a couple of practical application points as well. Uh, every time we open our mouth, we should consider um, these two things. Um, the first is, and you've probably heard it, it said, think before you speak. 
right? So you, you might have even seen this acronym used before. I, I found this little thing to, to help us. But before you open your mouth, ask yourself these five questions that you see on the screen. T, is it true? It, are, are the words I'm about to say, no, no matter what, given the situation, are they true? Right? It, it, is it true? If it's not true, don't say it. H, is it helpful? Even if it's true, is what you're saying going to help the other person uh, or is it going to hurt them? Uh, like, what's the purpose behind it? Are you doing it? Are you saying what you're saying to help them or are you saying what you're saying to, to hurt them? Or is it just to help you? But say things that will be helpful to others. So they're true, they're helpful, eyes inspiring. Is it going to encourage them? Inspiring them to good works, inspiring them to live out their faith. In, is it necessary? Even if those first three things are true, right? If it's true and, and helpful and inspiring, is what I'm about to say even necessary? Does it need to be said? Or does it not need to be said? Don't say it. And then K is kind. Is it kind? Is it gentle? Is it gentle hearted? Is it seeking the the goodwill of the other person. So, so is what we say is going to reflect these things or not? If what you say doesn't meet these rules, then again, just don't say it. And then here's the second thing. If you're having troubles, if you find yourself saying, oh, why did I just say that? What, what is wrong with me? Why am I? What's going on with my words? I would encourage you to do this. Put on Christ. Put on Christ. Look at Romans um, 13, 14. It says, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. So, so this verse instructs us to put on Christ. And, and, and again, this um, phrase, put on, those two words, put on, literally in the original language mean to, to clothe yourself in, to like put it on like you would this jacket. Like put on the Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, all of us got dressed this morning, right? By show of hands, everybody's got clothes on. <laughs> yeah. He, he, he's saying, hey, listen, when you start your day, then, then just like you would put your clothes on uh, and, and you would wear those all day long, put on Jesus. Put, put on the character of Jesus so that that what you say would be a reflection of his heart. Of where you would go what would be places that he would be okay with you going. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Put on the character of Jesus from head to toe and wear him everywhere. Let him, let him be the driving force for how you live your life and how you act and how you behave and the words that you say. Listen, if I'm being transparent, and I am, th this was a really tough one for me. Uh, it was tough to prepare. Um, it was difficult to teach. Uh, a pastor should never stand up and preach a message that that he hasn't preached to himself first. And that was absolutely true for me this week. God needed, uh, I needed God to teach me this lesson. Because as I was studying and working through the passage this week, I was convicted because the truth is I can be harsh with my words. I can be demeaning with my words. I can use wit and humor as weapons. And I can do that with my friends and with my family. Those I work with, I can be harsh when speaking about things that I disagree with. And so today, I've, I've just kind of felt like I just need to make a commitment. I want to make a commitment today. I actually made it earlier in the week, not just today. 
But I'm hoping that you'll make the same commitment with me today, and that's this, that as Christ followers, when we open our mouths, that what comes out of our mouths won't be cursing. That it won't be condemnation. That when we speak, that we won't start fires. That, that it won't be bitter, which really means poisonous. That it won't be salty. But that when we speak, uh, to everyone in our lives, our family, our friends, our coworkers, our enemies, that whenever we open our mouths, that we would speak Jesus. That we would speak in a manner worthy of his name. That we would speak Jesus to our children, that we would speak Jesus to our spouses. That we would speak Jesus when we reply to a comment on social media. That we would speak Jesus when we post anything on social media. That we would speak Jesus when we are speaking with our political rivals. That we would speak Jesus to our brothers and sisters in Christ. And that we would speak Jesus to those in our community, especially those who are far from Christ. Can we commit to doing that? I hope you'll join me in that. May we be people uh, who want to be freshwater springs. Who want to speak sweet water things into people's lives. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes and pray with me for just a moment before we continue worship? Um, Lord, I pray for everyone in this room uh, who would acknowledge their need for you to be the source and the wellspring of their soul, um, so that uh, when we open our mouths, that the things that we speak would not be bitter, that they wouldn't be salty, they wouldn't start a fire, they wouldn't stir up hatred or frustration, but that our words would speak of Jesus. Lord, we firmly believe um, that only Jesus can change this world. And you've chosen us, those of us who've placed our faith and trust in you, those who would describe ourselves as Christ followers, you've put um, that responsibility, you've chosen us to be the catalyst through which you want to do your work. We are the vessels through which you want to spread your word. And so, Lord, we want, we need um, our words to be your words. Uh, we want to speak Jesus to our families and to our wives and to our husbands and to our kids and kids to your parents. We want to speak Jesus to our enemies. We want Jesus to always be on the tip of our tongues. I pray that you would give us this morning the power to do so. Lord, we don't need uh, another TED Talk. We don't need another self-help book. We need your Holy Spirit to rein us in. <laughs> and we need to make wise choices the choice is ours. You've given it to us. So let us be people who speak Jesus. We pray this in the name of your Son. Amen.